Hello, my name is Mitch and I draw Blood Force, and we're here today for a bit of a special issue. Uh, yesterday we checked out Uncanny X-Men 274, so naturally today we're checking out Uncanny X-Men 275. But this one's a little, uh, little special for me, anyway. This is the first X-Men comic I bought uh, back in the day. So, let's get into that, but first... Uh, if you enjoy the channel, if you want to support me as an artist, uh, if you look in the description, there's a link to my Patreon there. And if you were to subscribe there, that would give you access to the Blood Force pages, as well as any process stuff, any behind the scenes, any Patreon exclusives. Also, if you were to go over to my Instagram, commissions there are now open. But enough of that, let's get to the issue in itself. So, before April of 1991, I had bought the odd comic. Not too many, though. You know, I remember having a couple of Daredevils, a couple of Incredible Hulks. I had an X-Men at some point, but it was like one issue, and I didn't know who anybody was. And probably a few Spider-Man. That was like the one that was like recognizable to me, apart from like Batman or Superman. So sometime in April of 1991, I think I went into my first comic shop. And it would be a while before I got into another one, but that seems to have flicked a switch of some kind. So next time I had money, I went down to just like a convenience store to buy what they had. And this is one of those comics. So this is, let me, you know what, let me show you the comics that were on the rack in April of 1991. Oof. So starting off, we have Silver Surfer number 48, which is kind of an intense comic, if I recall. So that introduced me to Ron Lim. Which is still pretty good. Next we have Ghost Rider number 12. Drawn by Javier Salteres and inked by Mark Texiera. And that had its own look. Next, there was What If number 24. Which is still, I think, the best What If comic I've ever read. I'll put it that way. I'll, I'll leave it there. I haven't read nearly as many What If comics as I need to have to make any kind of claim. But this is a good-ass comic. Next... Amazing Spider-Man number 346, and this introduced me to Eric Larson. And uh, one of the kind of, I think this is a bit of a classic cover now in retrospect. Next, there's Wolverine number 38, which introduced me to Mark Silvestri. Remember, I'm not me reading really any comics in, I would say... Two or three years before this? Most of the ones I read I've picked up a couple of years before. Next, X Factor, number 65, which introduced me to Will Sportatio. Or I think it's actually Portacio. Or Portacio. But that's that's in a bit of a wake-up call. I actually missed out on Spider-Man number 9. I mean, on the newsstand at the time. Next month I did buy Spider-Man number 10, which introduced me to Todd. And Uncanny X-Men number 275. So, I believe I'm going to be subtitling this, Why I Give Jim Lee a Hard Time. Really, this is why. This is the first work I saw from Jim Lee. And it's arguably his best. I mean, you start off with that. Which is, you know, I mean, at the time, the coolest cover I've ever seen. Which isn't saying too much, I suppose, because I haven't seen too many covers. But this is still considered probably one of the best X-Men covers of all time. And I think it might be Jim Lee's best X-Men cover. Thinking about it. I think the only one that's really in contention is... This one here, 270, which is a nice composition. But, I mean, you know, getting all of the active X-Men, or at least all the ones that are involved in this story, getting, you know, all of the uh, extra characters here. I don't think we even knew who this was supposed to be. I sure didn't, anyway. And getting Rogue in her Savage Land gear, that big, you know, that's a win. Everybody's ready for battle. All right, so Star Jammers Strike. So we're going to kick things off with a gigantic splash 
of the Star Jammers. I had no idea who the Star Jammers were. Um, in the context of the previous issue, I think we're probably not too sure why exactly the Star Jammers are here, although we, uh, Lila Cheney did teleport us across the galaxy and Deathbird was there, which implies that uh, Lalandra is involved. And I guess Lalandra implies Star Jammers. So that, you know, there, there is, there is some kind of context. And skip it again, and holy shit. And you want to talk about, like, this set the bar for a spaceship uh, candid shot for me. Or dramatic shot for me. You know, it's all made up angles. Like, Well, I mean, it's not angles. It's mostly curves and, and uh, weird panels and shit. And this would be from all the uh, anime that uh, Jim Lee is watching at the time, I believe. Or manga he's reading. But I don't remember seeing Jim Lee draw anything like this since moving... To, well, since the end of the Uncanny Run. And on top of that, he's got to draw Star Jammers dealing with the Imperial Guard here, too. He can't just draw this gigantic glory shot of the ship, which is going to be kind of fucking complicated to map out. And as we remember, Deathbird has captured the X-Men so that she can talk some sense into them about how they need to help her kill Professor X. And somehow that's not going too well. And yet this is at a time where for some reason everybody's in their training uniforms. It's a cool look, actually. And kind of nice. Like, it's, it's a nice change-up from the usual thing where everyone's in their individual duds. It's not, yeah, it's nice to get like a uniform look for a minute. And pretty great shot here. And I'll just get, some, get a bit of light here. And uh, just a nice ability to get some depth in. Because you look at how many figures are in this panel. There's eight figures here in different spots on the map. Like, Forge looks like he's a good, like, 30, 40 feet away from Storm. That ain't bad at all. So, Wolverine breaks free with the help of Jubilee and goes right for Deathbird. And that's probably one of the cooler shots you're going to see. Again, from Jim Lee. And Jim Lee has kind of come a long ways in not too long a time. You look at just, like, issue 268, which is only seven issues before this. And I mean, there's some stuff in here that's comparable, like this. I, this is, I think this is one of the first ones where he just looks like a flat-out demon. But this one here is, uh, like, a little awkward. There's these Wolverine action shots. They just need a little... They're, they're not quite uh, where he gets to. It's still great stuff. Don't get me wrong. But thinking where he is half a year from now... This is why I say Jim Lee is still learning at this point. And this is Jim Lee having gotten there. Cuts Jubilee free, even though we previously saw that they heal too fast for that. Which they cover here. <laughs> I think, again, this is a case of uh, Marvel Method. Because it seems Deathbird's pet can only counter a specific power per prisoner. What works against you doesn't against me and vice versa. So that's the solution. I, you know, hats off to Claremont for coming up with that, I guess. And Deathbird stabs Wolverine through the back. We get the nice beat, 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 beat. And Jubilee gets to pull his spear out so Wolverine can get his badass pose in and hunt her down. And it's funny, I don't see this pose get reproduced, really. But I thought this was like the greatest image of Wolverine at the time. And right when they're all escaping, that is when Star Jammers strike. Right? They do. A little too late to really help out, but... And they're all greeting each other for the first time, because, you know, we... Uh, you know, the X-Men and the Star... And the uh, Lylander and the Star Jammers are all... They've been hanging out for a while now, right? And we're going to fly to the aid of a couple of the Star Jammers... There were a few with uh, with Lalandra, but they have to take down the Imperial Guard. And we're going to get this gigantic nonsense page. 
which I remember looking at and thinking like, this is cool. And then, you know, you kind of move on because it's, there's just, there's too many guys and not enough going on. But this, you know, this is useful for, you know, so we don't have to one by one say who, address everybody by name. And Deathbird now is escaping and we get another cool shot of Wolverine as he catches up to her. I think I remember trying to copy this once or twice. And we got a lot of patter here from Gambit in the middle of the fight. And we get some some nice Chris Claremonti just uh, setting up a little bit of tension with, you know, Gambit asks a lot of questions. He's learning all he can about us without revealing anything about himself. Still, Storm trusts him. Why shouldn't I? It's a nice little thing to just, you know, in case I want to make a story out of that later on. And we get this, you know, relatively easy shot of everybody standing there. But, like, that's, like, a, a good, like, 13, 14 people standing in that panel there. And, you know, fit in very nicely. There's no depth to it. So he's not going all out on it or anything. Really, if you saw this in real life, they'd be like, why are they all lined up like that? But, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I have difficulty proportioning guys so that they make sense in standing next to each other. And uh, Lalandra's going to state that this all accounts for nothing if they don't track down Deathbird. Well, don't worry too much about that. That part's already done. So now they explain the whole deal, where Deathbird convinced Lila Chini to teleport them there to try and kill Xavier. But we didn't see anything about Xavier there. Do you happen to know where he is? And it's like, yes, we do. He was that dude on the cover that we didn't recognize. Right there. In his variant colors. And at this point, it seems like Charles Xavier has been missing for a while. And he's walking, of course. Which is also kind of weird. But he doesn't recognize Forge or Jubilee, or I would say Gambit, and possibly not Psylocke. So most of the 200s he wasn't here for, I guess. And now we're going to cut back to the Savage Land. Remember that one? We're getting a pretty good sense of scope in this thing. I mean, this was a, a pretty short battle here at the beginning. It did take up 18 pages, though. But yeah, we're back on board of the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicopters and uh, heading towards Zaladane's palace here. And there's tension on the helicopter as nobody trusts Magneto. Rogue has to wear battle armor because she doesn't have any powers, of course. And there's, you know, end-of-the-world threat stuff going on. And I think I recall this shot of Fury being reprinted fairly often. And this is like the standard Jim Lee shot with just every strap in the world, which isn't too far off really from the Steranko version. It's it's just kind of an, uh, the next step. But yeah, and then these vertical pockets. I assume that's a pistol strapped to his thigh, but there's another one there, I, I guess. Um, cigar holders, probably. Another pistol. And uh, what looks a bit like a mullet, but no, that's just Rogue's hair. And he's putting in work on these helicopters. He's having to keep putting these in here. I don't think he's happy to do it, but... And Magneto doesn't need to fly in a helicopter, which is probably for the best, because somebody probably would have shot him by now. And this is all catch-up exposition. Which is important, because remember, every comic can be somebody's first issue. This is my first issue. I need all this stuff to even know what the fuck is going on. And it's not like Uncanny X-Men was set up in chapters. Not usually, anyway. Where, okay, you know, I, I missed out on the next chapter by three, four issues. You know, you, you, you kind of had to come in at the beginning of the Claremont run, really, to start at Ground Zero. And we're going to learn here that Magneto uh, is growing uh, weaker because Zaladin is growing stronger. She's basically drawing all of the magnetic energy to her. Which doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's okay. Um, and also that Magneto killed the Russian guy's son. So that's one of the reasons he's not too willing to uh, forgive him. And the Russian commander has a moment where he's like, nope, fuck it. Shoots down Magneto. Which seems to sort of short-circuit his powers for a second. And almost like EMP the, uh, the helicopter. Which is interesting. I kind of wish they'd followed that up a little bit. So, the Nick Fury copter crashes, 
And the Russian helicopter, without Magneto's protection, is uh, kind of easy pickings for a bunch of mutants on pterodactyls. Meanwhile, during the copter crash, looks like Rogue survived the crash at least. Um, gets picked up by a Tyrannosaurus, which can't pierce the body armor. And uh, she manages to smack it to uh, either kill it or, no or uh, knock it unconscious. And she wasn't expecting to hit him that hard. Because, you know, again, remember, Rogue doesn't have her powers. Or doesn't think she does anyway. Uh, a little too late for the pilot here, by the looks of it, from the... I don't think these are Tyrannosaurus. not up in the tree. But, uh... Kazar and Zabu come to the rescue, or at least to Rogue's rescue. And it looks like Nick Fury survived too, and managed to get every single item of equipment out of the helicopter. So that's nice. So it's these three guys now against Zaladain, and we have to. We don't know where Magneto is, um, or the any of the Russians. It looks like the Russian colonel is still alive and is trying to sell out to Zaladain, trying to convince himself he can be useful to her, where. She can set up um, the Savage Land as a sovereign state with herself as the ruler. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't think that would work. But he's trying to convince her that negotiating with the UN might be more useful to her than just declaring war on the world. That jet ski's still available, y'all. And there's an interesting bit here where they're just walking through the Savage Land, right? They're just walking to Zaladane's hideout. Uh, nothing's really happening. They're just discussing what's going on here. And what's going on is that um, the the Savage Land is evolving more than it should. So, Kazar is noting trees that are a couple of years old that look like they're hundreds of years old. There are dinosaurs that should be hatchlings that are, you know, fully grown. And this is the result of the high evolutionary, apparently. When he restored the land to health, the process he used contained some element of fantastically accelerated growth. The problem is when you put that kind of extreme environmental pressure on a dynamic organism, you should expect an equally dynamic evolutionary response. And Nick Fury's like, so what does that mean? We're going to get smart lizards? Kazar's like, I live here. These guys are smart enough as it is. We're going to have a problem maybe a year from now. Which seems like Chris Claremont setting up another thread. I haven't read any Claremont recently, I'll say. Um, and I didn't read a ton before. I don't know how often he did this, where he'd just kind of, like, drop a breadcrumb. Like, that's something I can refer back to. Who knows if it actually turns into anything, but he could be setting up next year's X-Men problem. Except, of course, he's not on X-Men next year. And now we cut back again to Zaladane's Citadel. And now Zaladane is going to use her pods here to... <laughs> to uh, Draw the rest of Magneto's power into herself and basically make herself the most powerful magnet person on the planet. This is stuff that's showing up on Zaladane's henchman's screen here, where we see a little bit of Magneto's backstory. And it's, uh, it's a wild page. And we see stuff with Magneto's daughter burning to death in front of him. We see him confronting the Shadow King, which is going to come up again soon. And this is not, again, the kind of page you normally see from Jim Lee. I don't even remember him doing this before with the uh, the black, uh, well, I, I assume that's blood, but, uh, you know, just kind of splattering ink on, on the page. He's usually much more deliberate. And Zaladin cuts the session short, because that's as much as she can take, apparently. And they'll start again soon. And again, we get this cool shot of Magneto that Jim Lee has pretty much perfected at this point. And that everyone will copy. <laughs> Meanwhile, outside of the Citadel, Zaladin's troops see, I mean, what is most likely Rogue, only in her Savage Land bikini. But nobody's complaining. I believe this is standard Savage Land gear, at least when Jim Lee's drawing it. And this is, so for instance, this is Shauna the She-Devil and, and Nereal, 
I'm not sure who Nareel is. I think Shauna the She-Devil usually has... I don't know if she has her own title, but she's definitely her, her an existing character. And they're being mind-controlled by Worm. Because if you recall, that's his ability. And so this uh, this thing with with Rogue in the Savage Land bikini is it's distracting the soldiers, which I just, I just don't understand. But, um, yeah, and she's going to plow into them here. Which apparently knocks them all out. Again, it's just her in body armor, theoretically. Against like three of them. And they just kind of fall over. And that was just a hologram so that Jim could draw Rogue in a bikini. Fair enough. So, they infiltrate the Citadel. Magneto notices them before any of Zaladane's troops. And he starts a little bit of a ruckus so that they can bust in and start shooting. But, Zaladane, of course... Was able to use her magnetism on Fury and Rogue because they have all sorts of metal shit all over them. And something in there seems to have kick-started Rogue where her powers all of a sudden work again. I'm not sure if that ever got explained. I assume it did in... There's a, there's a bit in Uncanny 279, I think. Which might, which might cover it, but I'm not for sure. So, she scoops up Magneto, who is all shrunken from having his power drained. We might want to remember that. I don't know. He's still extremely ripped, though. But, I'm, you know, he's also kind of dehydrated. I guess that does it. And now Rogue can kick ass on all of Zaladin's troops, like she intended to before. But she doesn't account for Zaladin zamming her. All right. Why not? And in the confusion, Magneto has been forgotten. And he's able to crawl onto the siphoning device. So Zaladane has Rogue at her mercy, kind of, basically. She's got uh, some rubble porched over her. Magneto could potentially rescue her. But if he did that, then uh, before returning himself to full power, then Zaladane would probably kill him. So he goes, well, can't do that. Got to let Rogue get uh, smushed there. And he hits her with the Shkow, which I guess is more po more powerful than the Zam. So these are good things to know going forward. And now he's not a, a shrunken uh, mummy anymore. So, good for him. And just the barest hint of the Russian colonel sneaking up behind him here. And Magneto controls a, low, a nearby cable to impale him. Which is pretty gross. Not too bad at all. And electrifies him, and then that's the end of the Russian colonel. So, meanwhile, Fury's able to fish Rogue out from under the rubble. She's fine. She has her powers back, which makes her pretty much invulnerable. Zaladane's troops are all tied up, and Zaladane is now at the mercy of Magneto. And we're going to do a whole, you turned over a new leaf, you don't have to do this, you're better than this, and Magneto goes... No, I'm not. <laughs> if I leave her alive, then she'll try to do this again. And this is, uh, I think, um, sort of the end of a, a long change for Magneto, actually, where he tried to be a good guy. I think since before issue 200, because there's that trial of Magneto. And he was running Charles's school in Charles's absence, at least by the dialogue here. Uh, there's a bit where he's running the New Mutants, and apparently that did not go too well. Like, there's there's a lot of shit I, I should theoretically be catching up on. And at the end of the day, he's like, you know what? I tried to do some good shit, and none of it worked. Things were better when I was a bad guy. And honestly, this bitch pisses me off, so hell with it. And rebuilds his suit again, because that's how Magneto gets dressed in the morning, if we recall. And that is the last we'll see of Magneto until X-Men number one, actually. When, if we recall, he's kind of a villain again. So good stuff. And Rogue uses Worm's power here to um, mind control everybody to leave, which is useful. And then once they're outside, she's able to release them from the mind control thing, because she's in charge of his power at that point. And back on the other side of the galaxy. Lalandra has reassumed the throne with the help of Charles Xavier and the X-Men. 
and everybody's in formal attire for this particular ball. So Jim got to design some fancy dress stuff and uh, again, some decent depth of field. Um, this might not be the most fun stuff to draw, but Jim's going to, you know, he's going to, he's going to step up to the plate and it all looks absolutely solid. It's all, it's all good stuff. And Storm's still a little confused why Deathbird even brought them here, seeing as how they just helped to, you know, take her down. And Professor X just kind of waves it off like, ah, bitches be crazy. You never know. <laughs> and the newer X-Men are having a little bit of difficulty acclimating to being in space. Uh, the Chamberlain here is uh, noting that noting that there's only a couple of the X-Men present for the big gala, you know, coronation. And she's like, well, I, you know, actually, um, only Banshee, Wolverine, and I have, have been off world. The rest of us are just kind of like coping. And, you know, Wolverine likes to cope by beating the shit out of people. So, naturally, that's what he's going to go do. And Psylocke likes to cope by getting naked and uh, sitting upright, just in the shadow. Just enough so that we can't get uh, shit on by the comics code. And she gets blindsided by somebody who drags her off by her hair, naked. Like, she's naked, he's naked. It's, uh, it's, it's a little, all a little weird. And Jubilee is just kind of searching around the place. And exploring. And honestly, this is a better Jubilee look. Than the, than the, the Carrie Kelly Dark Knight Returns look that she, uh, she sports usually. Probably should have stuck with this. So the Imperial Guard and Deathbird are all being brought before somebody here who is uh, going to wipe their minds. Bringing the Imperial Guard under control orders Deathbird to be eliminated. And who is it? It's Charles Xavier, of course, who is going to talk supervillain for a bit, saying how we're not going to have any problems with the X-Men. After all, I'm, am I not their revered mentor? So, if they resist, I will crush them as easily as I've crushed the Imperial Guard. By whatever means necessary, they will serve the cause, and we have no further need of them. They will be destroyed. Next, Hopscotch! I don't know what that means. And that is it for Uncanny X-Men 275. Let's do this. So... As I said, this was the first X-Men comic I picked up when I was like 12. So, when I'm hard on Jim Lee, <laughs> this is why, as I said. this I'm comparing everything he does to this. And honestly, I don't think he's able to ever really reach this again. Um, for the next few issues, he's going at this clip. He's going at high speed, and he's going with the help of Will Sportatio, Scott Williams and Homage Studios, who are all cranking out pages at an, at an insane clip because they're working as a, as a studio, not as a penciler or an inker. And Jim Lee is having to be a little fast, kind of like Mark Silvestri earlier in the run. And he's having to be a little inventive. And he's having to come up with things he hasn't drawn before or that he's not, or that he's not comfortable drawing. And part of that is, again, he's still kind of learning a little bit, and also because he has a demanding writer, which is something that Jim Lee probably will not have again. I'm trying to think of the next thing. I mean, he works with Frank Miller later on, on the Batman thing, or I don't know who wrote for him on things like Hush or the Superman run or whatever. I would guess, seeing as how people don't seem to like the Superman run, that he wasn't pushed very hard on that. And I've seen his stuff on Batman, it's okay, but I don't think Frank Miller was very exacting, really, when it comes to the kind of stuff Jim Lee would have to draw. I don't think he's really been challenged since this, and I don't think he will be again, to be <laughs> obviously. I, I, I think that's probably pretty clear at this point. So that's a bit unfortunate, but we have this, this run, and we're going to, you know, we're still going to check out 276 and 277 before the week's out. So that'll be good stuff. 
But that's going to do it for this one. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notifications. Go follow me on Twitter. More importantly, go subscribe on Patreon. That's where all these videos go before they end up on YouTube. That's also where all the Blood Force pages go, as well as the behind-the-scenes stuff and any Patreon exclusives. In addition, if you go over to my Instagram commissions, there are now open. But that's going to do it for this issue. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.